Welcome everyone to the day two of ApacheCon 2021, um, ApacheCon at home. And our first speaker for the search track uh, today is Ilan Jinsberg, an Apache Lucene Solar Committer and also the newest member of the Apache Solar PMC. So welcome Ilan on that one. Uh, he holds a computer science engineering degree and a PhD in parallel computing and currently works on search infrastructure and integration problems at Salesforce in Grenoble, uh, or Grenoble, France. When not in front of a screen, he's often flying his paraglider above the Alps. Uh, great position to be in. Uh, today, though, he'll not be talking about the, the, the paraglider, but he'll be talking about the part of massively massive scale solar cloud and his ideas around removing the overseer. Um, over to you, Ilan. Thank you, Anshu. Um, so I, I work at Salesforce and, uh, and we host uh, CRM and other services for many companies. And one of our use cases is that we have a lot of clients, but not all of them are active at any one time. So basically to run our search uh, on solar cloud, we needed to scale a lot to be able to host a very, very large number of collections, uh, even though not all of them are gonna be used at the same time. So uh, removing Overseer, and I will explain what Overseer is for those who do not know, uh, is one step on a long journey to make solar cloud scale. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> okay, here is the plan of the presentation. In blue, it's, it's basically uh, trying to put everybody at the same level as far as understanding the architecture existing one and the proposed changes. And then in, in black, uh, more details of the work that has been done. So just a few definitions to make it really clear. Solar cloud uh, has the notion of collection and shard. Uh, collection is basically a, a corpus of documents you want to query and, and you index. Collection, when they grow large, they are split into shards, which are concepts as well. Uh, so here, the, the big collection is split into three parts. And every shard now has physical instantiations, copies of that shard that are called replicas that can live on various nodes of the cluster. Here, there are four nodes, and each one of them has between zero and one replicas of each shard. This is just so I can use collection shard and replica and you know what it means. So collection and shard that are also called slice are concepts and replica is something physical, a core uh, search for on the disk. Solar cloud. Uh, it's a distributed search cluster and it is based on solar, which is a standalone uh, search web server that is based itself on Lucene. Now Solar and Lucene are two separate projects. So on the left, you have Solar just embedding Lucene and being a search server. When we talk Solar Cloud, uh, it's the same code base uh, as Solar, but it uses Zookeeper, uh, the center DB in, 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 the, in the diagram. It uses Zookeeper for coordination between the various nodes of the cluster. So the nodes talk to Zookeeper for coordination. We'll see what type of coordination. And they talk to each other as well to exchange data. So there are two types of coordination. One is a cluster state and one is a so cluster state in general, which collection, which shards exist, etc. And one is for each shard, 
coordinating between the various replicas, the various copies of the child that live on multiple nodes. So this looks like a centralized uh, kind of central DB distributed system, quote unquote distributed. But in reality, it's slightly different. There is a notion of overseer and one of the solar cloud nodes uh, gets elected and if that node goes away another node gets elected and it has a special role uh, and that special role uh, makes that node take care of some of the interactions with zookeeper on behalf of the other nodes so that overseer node manages uh, the cluster state changes and running the collection API commands and, uh, and uh, config set API commands on behalf of the other node. The other node still uh, talk to Zookeeper for everything that is shard level coordination, the coordination between the different replicas of a shard. So, so what does it mean that the overseer node uh, manages these things for the other nodes. If we look at this diagram from the overseer doc, and I put the link in full text because I don't know if you will have access to the Google presentation, but you can just retype the URL. If we look at what happens, for example, when, um, when a collection API uh, request arrives on any solar cloud node in the cluster. Step one, it will be handled by the collections handler running on that node. And in step two, a zookeeper queue will be used to communicate a work item to the overseer. In step three, sometime later, the overseer will dequeue that work item and we start running it. In step four, it might directly do some state update and the cluster state is maintained for the whole cluster in Zookeeper. In step five, for some other types of state update, it will enqueue another request through another Zookeeper queue for a cluster state change. And then in step eight, it will wait uh to observe that change but between step five and eight another process that is part of the overseer at the bottom in six and seven will dequeue the cluster state change work item will do the cluster state mutation in seven and then the other overseer process that was running the collection api will observe that change in eight and then it can continue running and for example in step nine it will have to talk to other solar cloud nodes for example if that's a collection creation it will request the creation of replicas on these nodes these nodes might have their own interactions with the cluster state and overseer not depicted here and then the collection API uh, call will be complete. It looks a bit complex because it is. Many hops uh, we see for handling uh, a call between uh, nodes and threads, uh, even the overseer using Zookeeper to call into itself, meaning to the same JVM. It uses Zookeeper queues which is not always a good idea. Actually, there are some recommendations of what not to do is running queues on top of Zookeeper. It is a single point of execution. It's not a single point of failure because if Overseer fails, another one gets elected. But still, there is some contention. The code is extremely complex. If you looked at how Overseer processes the queues, um, it's a challenging code to understand. And then there are some scalability issues. Uh, under normal solar cloud uh, scale, uh, it's not really an issue. 
but there are uh, single thread processing of cluster state changes and there might be some contention on um, collection API processing even though it uses multiple threads because everything runs on the single node. So it looked pretty simple idea of when, when uh, a distributed system has a, a central point, which is Zookeeper, the question is, why do we need another central point, which is Overseer? Isn't one central point sufficient? So the proposal changed is to remove that Overseer role and, and have all nodes do whatever they need against uh, Zookeeper directly. So I list three items here. Shard leader election, they already do directly against Zookeeper. We, shard leader election is the coordination between various replicas of a shard of a collection. So that does not change. But then two things do change with the proposal. Cluster state changes are done directly by nodes against the cluster state stored in Zookeeper. And the collection API execution uh, is done directly on each node and interacts with uh, Zookeeper as needed. The motivation, uh, simplify the code um, and also understand the code because uh, it was not obvious. Uh, remove the, the Zookeeper queue management the issue is when you start to run into issues with the zookeeper queues, it only gets worse. And, and, and all the system kind of grinds to a halt because things do not decue. Remove uh, performance bottlenecks. I added eventual because under low scale, uh, low scale use, like if you have a few collections and Zookeeper is not getting challenged too much by all these queues. Everything works fine. But as you try to scale to thousands of collections, um, things do not look as good. And also simplify uh, and allow uh, more ambitious scale improvements uh, that I will list at the end. Okay, now I'm I'm gonna dip into uh, I'm gonna dig into the the two changes. Uh, the first one, I mean, no, these are the changes. Sorry, these are the changes. Uh, <clears throat> first is the cluster state change, and the cluster state is maintained for each collection in Zookeeper. There is a state.json file stored in Zookeeper that describes. Uh, the shards and the replicas of the collection basically so in order uh, this is done by overseer on a single thread in order to do uh, and I'm sorry a, a single thread for all the collections in the cluster not a single thread per collection in order to do that in a distributed way a compare and swap sometimes called test and set uh, strategy is used when a node wants to update the file it verifies that it has the latest version to not overwrite any other update and the second aspect uh, of overseer to be changed and distributed in the collection API and when I say collection I include the config set um, <clears throat> compare and swap uh, would not work very well because these are really long running operations and and the likelihood of something changing in the meantime would be too high. So uh, the implementation uh, is using distributed locking based on Zookeeper. <clears throat> what we end up with once we have these two changes in is that a collection API command is being run in a linear fashion uh, by a single thread handling all the interaction with Zookeeper. There are no jumps 
to the overseer back and forth. Okay, so let's look at the cluster state update. So the, the conditional update in Zookeeper, the compare and swap, basically you read a file, you update the file, resolve the changes you want the file to include, and then you conditional update, which means your update fails if something has changed, if the file was modified from the copy you've read. So the way this got applied, because uh, <coughs> failing, failing is pretty easy, but uh, the way the overseer works is that nodes send w whatever updates they want uh, the overseer to apply, and then the overseer serializes everything to make sure there are no overwriting, that no updates overwriting each other. So, in order to simulate the same behavior in a distributed way, instead of sending the updates to overseer, we record them in, in, in a memory data structure. And uh, at the point where the recording is done and, and uh, the thread wants to apply the changes, we are trying to apply them to the copy we already have or the copy we read from that node of the state.json file. If the right, if the conditional update succeeds, it means we've updated and managed to write to Zookeeper something without any other node uh, doing a concurrent update. Uh, we won, the update got applied and nothing, nothing got overwritten. If the conditional update fails, we reread the latest copy, we rerun uh, the, the player, if you will, on the recorded sequence, and, and we apply again. And, and usually, uh, unless there is extremely high contention, uh, it works the first time or after a few attempts. And the mutating command is the data structure uh, used for for this type of recording. It's um, quite similar to the to the redo and do uh, type of <coughs> of structures in programs that support that. So once we have cluster state updates uh, implemented in that way, when a collection API runs, if it runs, even if it runs on the overseer as it does currently, uh, it does not have to enqueue uh, a message for the overseer cluster state update to do an update, but it can do it right away. So it's faster. Now, when we want to distribute the collection or the config set API execution, if you remember, these requests are received by any node. Uh, and instead of enqueuing through Zookeeper to Overseer, we want that node to run them. So um, we've implemented read write locks based on Zookeeper. And for a given operation, an operation can be at the replica level, at the shard level, or at the collection level. For example, um, at, the rep at the replica level, it can be changing the property of a replica. At the shard level, it can be splitting a shard. And at the collection level, it could be changing the property of a collection. So we acquire multiple locks to allow the highest possible concurrency. I can work concurrently on two replicas of the same shard, but I cannot work on a replica of a shard if something else is modifying the shard at the same time. And this mimics, um, if you know the overseer code, there is a, a locking strategy within the overseer that uh, does about the same thing. There are a few cracks, but otherwise it does about the same thing. 
to allow high concurrency yet protect uh, concurrent actions from stepping on each other. So we acquire uh, in, in the appropriate sequence to avoid deadlocks, multiple read or write locks in order to run a single collection API command. Once these locks are acquired, the command can run to completion and when it needs to do a cluster state updates, it does it uh, using the mechanism I described previously. The links uh, at the bottom here are the entry point in the, in the solar code, as well as the distributed lock uh, zookeeper recipe that was implemented. If we go back to the initial diagram of the interaction, remember the API request came on the it came on the node here, and, and then it went through the queues with multiple queue iterations. So what we have now instead, the solar cloud node receives the API request and handles it in the collections handler. All the cluster state updates it needs to do, it does directly against Zookeeper. It also interacts with uh, distributed logs, not depicted here. And it talks to other solar cloud nodes the same way in the diagram on the left, uh, the overseer command execution was talking to other nodes. These other nodes, uh, they might as well interact with the state in Zookeeper, and they will also do it directly and not going to overseer. One interesting aspect of the collection API, <coughs> I think only the collection API, not the constricted API, is that there is a notion of an asynchronous call. From a call execution, uh, all calls are asynchronous, actually. Once you request, uh, once you send a collection API request, uh, it executes it executes in a synchronous fashion. It means you cannot interrupt it. If you do a non-synchronous call and you get a timeout, it's only your waiting, the, the waiting for the call to complete that times out, but the call is not interrupted and there's no way to interrupt it. And there's no way to monitor it either. If you request an async call, you still cannot interrupt it but at least you can monitor it. So in the overseer implementation, uh, these calls are put in persistent zookeeper queues. So basically, even if, uh, if the overseer dies, for example, after a request was submitted, when the new overseer gets elected, it will reprocess whatever was not processed in the queue and the request will be processed. In the distributed fashion uh, described in this presentation, the collection API runs directly on the node that received it. So if that node dies, the collection uh, API request fails. <coughs> Given the caller must be able to handle a failure of a collection API request anyway, this is okay. It does not it does not require any change on the caller side. And in order to give the same semantics uh, of asynchronous calls to the caller and have uh, this semantic correct whether the command was ex executed and succeeded executed and failed or was not executed yet or will never be executed because the node just died after receiving it and nothing happened. Uh, we introduce a combination of persistent and ephemeral nodes tracking in, in, uh, in Zookeeper, the combination of which uh, 
provide the, the correct uh, async um, when uh, async status is checked, provide the correct status to the caller. Uh, the details are in, in, in distributed API async tracker class. I do have a, a slide that I might not show that describes the, the strategy, but we'll see later if anybody is curious about that. Benefits, which I kind of touched uh, at the beginning, benefits of these two changes. Uh, I would say in most cases, the main benefit is, is um, simplicity. Simplicity of the code and, and the execution, following the execution, uh, be it a debugger or trying to understand the stack trace, what failed, um, because uh, with overseer interactions, when things do not work, uh, all we know is either timeout or something is not present in Zookeeper where we hoped it would be present. And it requires a lot of digging to try to understand what happened. So that's maybe the main benefit to most of us. The code itself is a lot simpler. Um, uh, because of how complex queue execution is in Overseer. In most cases, with some limitation, uh, the performance is better. So uh, I, I did some tests of uh, creating a collection, things go, uh, I don't remember the numbers, but I think much faster because all the zookeeper queues and back and forth and DQ times slow down things. The things that can be slower is when uh, there are many concurrent updates to state.json. For example, if you create a collection with many replicas and all the nodes that create the replicas in parallel try to update the state at the same time, uh, they will have to do multiple retries. So um, uh, there is a, a, a another change that went into Solar 8 point, don't remember how much, and 9, which is called Per Replica States by Ishan and Noble. It addresses uh, in part uh, this type of limitation and maybe in the future we need to have a, a different collection state distribution in, in Zookeeper rather than a single file representing the whole collection to increase concurrency. And the other benefits uh, of the removing overseer is that it makes it easier uh, to, uh, to go further two slides from here, I will say what are the next steps. The current state of this overseer removal work, it is complete. It is in Solar 9. It's, it's not in any 8 version and will not be. Uh, the way it was implemented, if you don't do anything, uh, the Solar 9 or main branch, but it will eventually be called Solar 9, uh, overseer behavior is the default, so nothing has changed. If you want to uh, activate the distributed uh, strategy, you can set to true these uh, distributed cluster state updates and then the collection config set execution. You could set to true only the first one, but not only the second, if you wanted to test or eventually I believe these two configs will be merged into a single one, distributed or overseer based. And then the overseer is still used because some unrelated um, uh, needs of a single cluster, singleton, uh, the overseer was used for plugins that need only one instance running in the cluster. And they can stay there. 
but eventually once the overseer is uh, removed from its uh, its main roles of cluster state and collection API, uh, the process should be renamed because it will not be overseeing anything. It will just do cluster single talk. Um, future work. So, uh, again, or maybe I haven't seen this, said it before, so, th this future work does not strictly require the removal of Overseer, but removing Overseer simplifies many things in the, in the cluster, in the code, and makes it easier. And also, um, it was for me, and I believe for many, uh, a pretty obscure overseer, the way really the detailed way in which it works was pretty unclear. And um, I know I needed to go through all the complexity of redoing basically everything in a different way to understand in a very fine way, uh, very yeah, fine, fine-grained way uh, what was going on. It was also related to uh, work we did on the auto-scaling framework uh, around cluster state. So the future work, uh, one and maybe uh, the first two are the easiest one, uh, lazy cluster state management. Today the cluster state um, <clears throat> Uh, there is a cluster state cache maintained on all the nodes of the cluster with uh, watches on changes in Zookeeper with different level of details depending on the collections that are present or not on the node. But that makes a lot of Zookeeper watches and a lot of updates and rereads from Zookeeper. For example, if you have, um, let's dream, uh, 500,000 collections on a, on a cluster and, and you create a new one, a tiny collection with a, one shard and one replica on some node, all the nodes will be notified and all the nodes will read back the list of uh, 500,000 collections from Zookeeper. And that's really not needed. I mean, that can be changed. Anyway. The second point is lazy uh, core loading. Just lower the memory pressure. So um, transient cores already exist, and 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 David Smiley has done work to try to to enable them for uh, for Solar Cloud. Uh, I, I'm not sure about how complete is that work, but basically reduce the the amount of data that has to be loaded. And, and that's something that is internal to a node. Basically, the core might be loaded or not loaded by from other nodes. Uh, they do not care and, and would not know because that node would be participating, that core that is unloaded would be participating in the same way in all the elections that maintain the cluster state. And that's maybe the third bullet, the most uh, ambitious one, is to reduce uh, the overall cluster state management for replicas or shards or collections that are not used. How do I, let's say Solar Cloud uh, is able to actively manage 1000 collections. And let's assume I have 500,000 collections, but only a thousand of them are active at any given time. How do I make the 499,000 other collections not put any load on the system so that they can just be there and be reactivated when they're needed and not bother uh, by having watches or threads or CPU or memory usage the rest of the time. So these three bullet points are ambitious, especially the last one, ambitious to very ambitious. But uh, 
if slash when uh, we get to this, then the scalability of solar cloud uh, will scale by multiple orders of magnitude in terms of data size. Uh, not necessarily request rate of indexing and querying, but data size. And, and that's basically uh, my goal. And that's it. And I think we have questions for, we have like 40 minutes. Oh. Thank you so much, Ilan, for that great presentation. And like me, I'm guessing everyone else enjoyed the talk. Uh, we did get a question about asynchronous collection API requests, and you obviously covered it before the end of the talk. So that question is already answered. Uh, do we have any more questions? Um, just uh, in case you've missed parts of this talk, or if you came here late, uh, all the talks at ApacheCon are going to be recorded. They're going to be made available. So if you want to go through the through Elon's talk again at a later point, uh, all of these would be available on YouTube. Um, let's wait, give people some time to ask any questions if they may have anything. We have about four minutes. So are there any planned, Alexi's question is, are there any planned improvements for the observability of long running collection API commands? I guess async API is more observable, uh, observability. So, um, I, I, I do not have plans around this. It, it should not, I mean, if you just want to know uh, where in the process things are, we would need to define, I, I'm just thinking aloud, we would need to define milestones in, in each command, like number of whatever created or which phase of the command execution are we in. And it would not be very hard to have the command update its state in Zookeeper somewhere so that it can be observed by get status or something like this. So that would not be very complex. If we wanted to interrupt a command, it should not be very complex either uh, because this can happen anyway if there is a failure midway. And the collection API commands are not very good, not today with Overseer and not tomorrow with this distributed strategy. If you interrupt the work after some things have already been done, but not everything, you can end up with a not completely consistent state. Like you created the shards, but you did not create the replicas. And then you cannot redo the same command again, but you will need to observe the state and to issue a finer command to get the in, incomplete state to where you want it. So I would say there are no plans, but there is nothing preventing uh, making plans. That's a, that's a great answer. Um, we have another question from David. Uh, does removing the old complex code make sense for Solar 9? Its, it's mere presence keeps things com more complicated. So what are your thoughts on that? So my thought on that is that as much as I would like to think that every line of code I write does not have any bug, uh, I'm trying to be a bit more realistic. And given that the new way of doing things was not uh, exercised in real production conditions, I would be afraid to remove it. Uh, too soon. So I would like first uh, significant runs with a new strategy with a, a safe fallback if things break to the overseer mode. And then we also need to understand uh, the, the parts that might be less efficient when we have a contention on updates to the state notation of a given collection. 
how big that is a how big of a problem is that and do we need to solve it first so i would not feel like we're moving uh overseer right away i would be happy though to make the distributed strategy the default knowing people have a fallback but um, maybe we wait until nine dot something to do that. Okay, and we have one more question because we're running out of time. Uh, from Nico, uh, who's asking, can this functionality be enabled for existing clusters? So I, I believe the question is like, uh, for an already running cluster, can there be a rolling restart instead of having to shut down everything uh, to switch over from the old oversteer situation to the new one that's a very good question the problem is the locking uh if uh the way overseer manages locking is obviously different from the way the distributed strategy manages locking so you could in theory switch your nodes one by one to be distributed and at the end uh remove the overseer node <clears throat> you would run into concurrency issues if during this process any collection api or any cluster state change did happen if you can somehow guarantee that that won't be the case there would be a way to switch a running cluster from one mode to the other um, so to summar to summarize, the, the, the overseer needs to kind of go away during that duration. There's no other way to work around it, only because of the way they're structured in terms of how they lock on on things, right? It's not that it needs to go away. If if you do the update without shutting down the cluster, it means you don't yep. do all nodes at the same time, but one by one. Yep. After you did half the nodes, half of them can do updates in one way. And the other half would do update in another way. And the centralized. Yep. It's not the same. If we really, really wanted, I don't really, really want. If we really wanted to support that use case, we will need to release an intermediate version where the overseer does its own locking and, in addition, does the distributed locking. That way, it would be compatible with the distributed. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, unless there is a huge demand i don't think it's worth the, it's uh worth, worth the effort the investment. yeah yeah okay great uh well uh we're out of time uh the next session starts in seven minutes thank you ilan for doing this talk very informative and very very nice